Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started by reading the bios and then the presentation description for the Deer Lake Management Story, Something for Everyone presentation. And we have two speakers with us today, Cheryl Clemens and Jim Miller. Cheryl Clemens with Harmony Environmental has provided consulting support to the Deer Lake Conservancy since its beginnings. Her work backs up volunteer efforts with technical advice, grant writing, plan development, project design, and installation oversight. On a similar note, Cheryl will back up Jim's presentation today, presenting some of the topics and answering questions as needed. And then our second presenter is Jim Miller. Jim Miller has managed Deer Lake Conservancy water quality projects as a volunteer since the organization formed in 1995. The organization's most notable achievement is significant improvement in lake water quality following installation of extensive water quality practices. For this achievement, the organization received national recognition in 2015 from the North American Lake Management Society as a lake management success story. The Deer Lake story includes descriptions of organizational structure, partnerships, fundraising, installation of water quality best management practices on large and small scales, conservation easement and land purchases and donations, trail development, maintenance, and more. The Conservancy is currently updating their lake management plan. While your organization may not have the resources to take on all of these activities, there's certainly something that you can learn from the Deer Lake story and use to help your own lake. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl and Jim. I'm excited to be moderating for them because they are in my county, in Polk County. Good afternoon and welcome to the Deer Lake Conservancy's presentation on watershed restoration. We would like to thank the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for their continued support in helping us to be successful. The Deer Lake Conservancy began in 1995 with the goal of improving water quality in the lake. The lake was experiencing degraded water quality from the oligotrophic lake of the 1950s to the eutrophic lake of the 1980s and 1990s. In this limited amount of time, I would like to focus on some specific lessons we learned that may help your organization to be successful. Next slide, thank you. In establishing a board of directors, most groups put together a group of like-minded individuals with little regard for the skills that will be needed to fulfill the organization's goals. I suggest that instead you look at the skill sets you will need to accomplish these goals. You may need an accountant, attorney, a real estate professional, a marketing advisor, and an administrator. Next. Once we put together this team, we realized what we did not have was scientific expertise. Perhaps the most important thing that we did was to find a consultant with a background in water biology and limnology. This allowed for the development of a management plan based on good research, not on personal agenda. Next. You may want to begin by establishing a 501c3. This ensures that, that donations made to the organization will be tax deductible. This process takes six to nine months. What it means is that a $10,000 donation may have an after-tax cost to the donor of, 10, of six to $7,000. Next. To begin the organization, we found 10 people willing to contribute $1,000 each to create a budget with, with which we could work from. One of the most important things in fundraising is to show initial visible success and pose solutions to manageable problems. People will be overwhelmed if you tell them there's a problem that it seems impossible to solve and your fundraising will ultimately not be successful. Next. Some of the educational tools used by the Deer Lake Conservancy are an annual report, which you have a copy of if you choose to download it, our website, an annual meeting where we do a visual presentation, 
and the brochures, which also will be in your digital packet. Next. We began with a geographic assessment done by an engineering company. The summary is that we needed to increase our stormwater retention to slow runoff from storm waters and stabilize the stream banks in ravines flowing into Deer Lake. This study is grant eligible. By following these guidelines, it would serve to reduce the phosphorus and sediment being carried into the lake. What this slide shows is the relationship between phosphorus reductions and secchi disk improvements. You will note that an 11% reduction in phosphorus yields an approximately 10% improvement in secchi disk readings but a 50% reduction in phosphorus yields a 100% improvement in secchi disc readings. We have volunteers that do our secchi disc readings and they've, done by a long, they've been done for a long time by a retired science teacher. Next. Deer Lake is an 812 acre lake with 7,400 acres of watershed surrounding it. What we tried to do was look for permanent solutions to protect our drainage areas. We now have control structures in our nine largest watersheds. I would caution you not to attempt your largest projects first, but start with a project that you can accomplish with the resources that you have. Next. As you look at these projects, trying to think of how they are applicable to your lake, an early assessment can be made by boat by looking for a dark sediment plume after a significant storm. The size of this sediment plume is an indicator of the amount of sediment that's being discharged from that watershed into the lake. Watershed 2, our first project, was not the most significant source of phosphorus. It did, however, have the steepest gradient so water flowing from this watershed was delivered the most rapidly to the lake. The outflow of this watershed on private property washed out virtually every year. Since the Conservancy established this control structure, it is not washed out since. Next. The control structure seen here, established in 1997, is an 11-foot high 630 feet wide wing dam. It has a pool of water of approximately five acres and slows the flow of water from approximately half a day down to two weeks. The, the structure was surrounded by 15 acres of native prairie. This was done for several reasons. Certainly it reduces the maintenance of the area but prairie plants with their three to four foot root structures are not easily pushed over by uh, stormwater runoff as grasses would be. The other advantage to using prairie plants is that they have evolved over the last 10,000 years to take up phosphorus whenever it's available to them. We have found that in some of our prairies, they take up 90% of the phosphorus that would otherwise flow into the lake. Next. Watershed 3 was a large technical challenge. It is only a 350 acre watershed, but the outflow of this water came at 170 cubic feet per second. And in order to stabilize the watershed, it was necessary to reduce that to 40 cubic feet per second. Two dams were established, the North and South dams. The South dam I'll say a little bit about because it's an 18 foot high dam. A dam of this size requires a permit from the Department of Natural Resources and also needs to be engineered. It takes approximately one year for that process of engineering and approval to take place. What it did was allow us to stabilize the ravine. We removed some trees, changed the slope of some of the banks that had been washed out, and revegetated the bank and the ravine floor. A, set, a sandbar, at the outflow of this watershed in the lake 
had existed for decades. That sandbar has now largely disappeared. A good analogy here is that watersheds are to the health of the lake as arteries are to the health of your heart. John Muir noted that everything in nature is connected. Next, Watershed 3 was our first purchase of land of approximately 11 acres. It had two ponds that were restored. They had been filled and drain tiled for agricultural use. You can see one of the ponds here. We also removed 21 four axle dump truck loads of tires that had been dumped into this ravine years ago. They were taken to recycling in Barron County. Next. In establishing this conservation area, it resulted in the surrounding land being taken out of agricultural use and put into low density residential use. This pond is behind the South Dam. Next. Watershed four was our largest watershed. It is approximately 2,300 acres, 1,500 acres of which are row crop, and they all drain through this parcel. The channelized flow through this parcel produced a great deal of erosion. What we did was we regraded the floor of the parcel to a 150 foot wide drainage way, completely flat all the way across. 80 species of prairie plants were planted along the parcel and through the drainage way to protect the springs which are immediately south of the parcel. A good deal of the parcel was then enrolled in the conservation reserve program, yielding some income to the conservancy from that parcel. Next. Uh, this is the prairie that was replanted uh, in uh, 1998 to slow the water coming from those agricultural fields. Next. Immediately south of this prairie was Rock Creek, the largest source of spring water, off lake spring water flowing into Deer Lake. The agricultural damage from sediment and phosphorus had turned this creek into a green sludge. The creek has now been cleared for years. Um, at this point, I'd like to recommend, thank you, I'm going to take a drink of water. At this point, I'd like to recommend the documentary done by Robert Redford called The Unforeseen. Um, it's an analogous but much larger situation in Austin, Texas. Uh, it is available on Netflix through their library service. Next. The Flagstead Farm was the largest project undertaken by the Deer Lake Conservancy. It was a $500,000 project. This is not a project we could have even contemplated at the beginning of the organization, but by building the capacity uh, of the organization to undertake these projects, we were able to accomplish this. This is located on the south side of Deer Lake, immediately adjacent to US Highway 8. It is open for tours, there is signage, and there are brochures available. There is something in bloom throughout the growing season. Next. The Flagstead Farm delivered a great deal of phosphorus to Deer Lake, as well as highway drainage containing road salt. Any of you who were able to attend last year's North American Lake Management Society conference, uh, there were a number of seminars presented on the damaging effects of road salt on freshwater water bodies. Next. The Flagstead Farm was planted, planted with a hundred species of local ecotype prairie plants. It is the largest local ecotype prairie restoration in the state of Wisconsin. For, for this, we received help from the Department of Natural Resources, as well as the Science Museum of Minnesota, which contributed some rare prairie plants. The sign technology now allows us to communicate a great deal of information 
This was not an option at the beginning of the Deer Lake Conservancy. These signs explain why and how these projects benefit the lake. Next. Prairie maintenance is literally a prescribed burn every five years to keep small trees and not a na non native grasses at bay. Next. Next. This is a wetland at the south side of the uh, property. Uh, it had been dug with a backhoe. It had been dug, this channel had been dug with a backhoe in the 1950s to drain out this entire wetland complex for agricultural production. The Conservancy has now restored 12 wetlands, most of which had been drained for agricultural use. We have also restored 12 gravel pits on our properties. Next. Our latest project is the Watershed One Diversion proposal. This involves this five acre spring pond, which flows through an agricultural pond to the south of 140th Avenue with barnyard runoff and flushes the mixture into Deer Lake. Next. This is the agricultural pond. This project will involve in trying to bypass the agricultural pond to deliver the fresh spring water from the north pond downstream from the agricultural pond. This will leave concentrated agricultural water, which can then be more effectively treated. Next. This shows the location of the Deer Lake Conservancy major projects. We have 294 acres, all of which are open for tour. Next. This was a difficult decision to make early on in the uh, Deer Lake Conservancy's history, whether we would purchase property or work with easements. Because of a very limited budget early on, we worked with easements. Now these easements have expired, and in one case, we are looking at paying seven to eight times what it would have cost to acquire the property that we put our first structure on. The other problem with these is that easements are not really permanent. They require constant monitoring and an ownership change may make it extremely difficult to continue the easement. The cost of legal defense of a conservation easement has been put at seventy to $100,000 by the Land Trust Alliance. Next. The decision whether to use easements or acquisition is largely a question of long-term or short-term management of the property. Next. Next. This is the Johnson Preserve, a 90-acre parcel which protects five ponds and a lagoon adjacent to the lake. It also protects 451 feet of pristine, undeveloped lakeshore on the north side of Deer Lake. Next. This is a mapping of the Johnson Preserve and its relationship to the north side of Deer Lake. Next. The Lower Rock Creek acquisition allowed us to purchase the land that uh, extended south from the Rock Creek Conservation Area, north of 140th Avenue, all the way to Deer Lake. This is a spring-fed creek. The other benefit uh, shown in the slide on the right is we were able to put in a sedimentation basin to control agricultural outflow that had otherwise been uncontrolled from farm fields to the north and west. This agricultural runoff of was previously delivered directly into the Rock Creek spring water. Next. This is a mapping of the Rock Creek conservation area and it took us 13 years to acquire the six parcels that make up the Rock Creek conservation area. Um, four of these parcels had been in the same family for almost 100 years they were reluctant when we first approached them 
to sell the property. But after 10 years and the opportunity for them to tour the properties and see what we had done, they decided that the Deer Lake Conservancy would in fact be the best steward for this property. So establishing credibility can be key to long-term management. The Conservancy now owns all of Rock Creek from the spring sources to the lake itself. In land ownership showing these conservation areas, we have spent about the same number of dollars that one alum treatment would have cost. But we feel that we have gained more than 100 years of protection for the lake versus 10 to 15 years for an alum treatment. Next. The Deer Lake Conservancy has now developed trail systems through all of its conservation properties. This recreational component not only brought in new members, but once we had a trail system where people around the lake could get in to see what we were doing, we doubled the membership in the organization in the next year. The trails expand people's knowledge and allow for better decision making. Additionally, lakes have small lots and natural areas are very rare. In 50 years, open spaces may be completely gone. Next. The Conservancy has five miles of trails interconnecting several of our conservation areas. We have signs and brochures available to explain why the area was developed and what protection it affords for the lake. Next. Some views from the Dry Creek Conservation Area in the spring with the apple blossoms along the Conservancy Trail. Next. Our conservation areas have something in bloom through most of the growing season. Next. Our conservation trails are very popular in the winter for snowshoeing and for winter hiking. Next. These large boulders left by the Wisconsin Glacier 10,000 years ago are along the edge of the Rock Creek Trail. Deer Lake is an old glacial lake. What we have tried to do, what we have tried to do is identify a parcel of land in each of the largest watersheds draining into the lake, which allow us to control phosphorus and other pollutants that would otherwise flow unchecked into the lake. Without the ability to control the inflow from these watersheds, we cannot control the water quality of the lake itself. We feel that we have secured for future generations the ability to protect Deer Lake. In closing my portion, I would like to note that the North American Lake Management Society Conference for 2020 is scheduled for Minneapolis from November 16th to 20th. If you would like to learn in detail some of the benefits of lake restoration and how to manage these projects, I strongly urge you to consider attending this conference. I'm now going to per turn the presentation over to Cheryl Clemens of Harmony Environmental, who more than any other person is responsible for the success of the Deer Lake Conservancy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim, and I'm not sure I, I um, deserve that compliment. Um, I just want to say hello to everybody first. I see some familiar faces on the list and I wish I could be there to see you in person. I'm gonna focus a bit on what we call our direct drainage project. With um, the larger watershed projects addressed, those that Jim has had discussed, in 2008 the Deer Lake Conservancy moved on to focusing on more um, the smaller projects that were closer to the lake. So we address some of what we call medium-sized projects, and now we're calling them neighborhood projects, um, many, many of which had gullies that were forming and eroding into the lake, and then working with individual waterfront property owners and addressing backlot development as well. So what we provided in that, what we provided and still provide in that direct drainage project is free technical assistance to landowner, landowners, which um, starts with a site visit with the landowner 
And then if a project is identified, we move on to financial assistance. Um, this was um, a kind of, it had a slow start back in 2008. We, we had difficulty um, getting people to understand what we were trying to do and take on projects. But we've really picked up steam as we, as we go along. Um, we've really been able to get landowners engaged in understanding concerns related to runoff and the nutrients that runoff carries to the lake um, and have them help, help us identify concerns and also identify um, solutions. The technical assistance to homeowners is free and the cost sharing um, is 75% for the larger neighborhood size projects and 50% for the waterfront projects, all supported by grants, um, lake protection grants from the Department of Natural Resources. Next slide. So the concepts for managing runoff on waterfront property are the very same concepts that we use on the larger projects. The first is to try to minimize hard surfaces, those impervious surfaces that lead to more runoff going to the lake. Vegetation, there you can see those deep roots of the prairie grasses that Jim was talking about. And then finally, diverting water so that we can direct it to infiltration areas such as rain gardens. Um, I think the one thing about this, this um, these concepts that we shared with waterfront owners to understand their issues and potential solutions has also helped them understand the larger, the larger projects and be even more supportive of the larger projects. So I mentioned that these projects started in 2008. This is one of the first rain garden projects um, and it was actually a series of rain gardens on two adjacent properties. Um, this early project we really did showcase both with homeowners and landscapers with some open houses and tours. Um, and and um, the landscapers have been a, a very important set of partners in this, in this project um, and in surrounding areas too. We, I pro we probably have 10 or so landscapers that have worked on these projects and are available to bid and install projects in our area. Next slide. So the result of this, there are about 292 properties on Deer Lake. And I've been out to, or someone working with me has been out to 42% of these over the years. So this is, this is a long-term um, project that has reached a lot of people on the lake. Of these people, not everyone needs to have a project. Um, these, 52 projects that I show that have been installed on the lake would be those that are cost shared. Sometimes owners are doing the right thing already um, and maybe are just looking for a few minor um, suggestions and others just want to make changes on their own without the cost sharing. So these 52 projects are all cost shared. Um, one thing I want to mention is that this has really picked up steam over the years. We've had three grants, three lake protection grants to support these um, direct drainage projects. The most recent one was started um, in 2019 and funded through the end of 2021. And we have already, um, all of our projects for waterfront projects or waterfront funding are committed already. So we, um, and I think the, the large rain events of last year and the erosion that was evident really um, gave us a push for projects last year. One other thing that has become really important to us, um, in addition to this kind of the standard educational tools that are available, is referrals from neighbors are very important. And many of these projects are, you know, the contacts come because they've seen what their neighbor has done. And as, um, and as, new people move on to the lake. Many times they're moving to the lake because they have friends on the lake and their friends tell them about the conservancy and the, this assistance that's available. 
Um, we are going to take questions at the end, so um, we'll be able to answer some of these questions that are that are popping up. Next slide. So I'm not going to go through this timeline, and I realize that you can't see all of this, but I do want to mention that this timeline from 1995 when the organiz organization started until 2018, this is in your newsletter, so this kind of gives an overview. Um, it is obviously a long-term um, effort, and that was the main point that I wanted to make there. Next slide. So you remember that Jim put this slide up, which came from some of original modeling that was done back before the Balsam Branch Priority Watershed Project started. And uh, the Conservancy set goals for, um, for improvements um, or for, for phosphorus reduction. And the watershed phosphorus goal was a 65% um, phosphorus loading reduction. Um, in the watershed, which hits at about the 37% um, overall lake phosphorus reduction. So how are we doing on that? We are tracking um, phosphorus reduction with all of the projects that have been installed over the years. And this tracks, this tracks the installation. So that big drop um, from starting in 1996, that really reflects those larger projects that Jim described um, that were installed early on with the help of the Balsam Branch Priority Watershed um, Project and lots of help from Polk County at that time. Um, right now we're in the, the process of a, of a lake plan and I'm going through and reassessing these reductions and, and trying and making sure we've accounted for everything. So we'll be, we'll be going through that as part of our lake planning process. But our, our reductions are at about 61% now from 1996. So how has that, how has that shown up in the lake? This chart shows July and August average secchi depths um, starting in, no, I can't even read that, 1985 or 1987 when the Secchi depth reading started to um, 2018. And it bounces around like it does in most lakes. Um, re recall that the Conservancy work started around 1995. And what I want to give you is an average by decade. So from 1990 to 1999, the average Secchi depth was 10 feet. From 2000 to 2009, it was 11. And then from 2010 to 2019, that average is 17 feet. So it took a while for the, the in-lake response. The residence time of Deer Lake is just under five years for the water to, to enter and leave the lake. Um, and it took a while for us to see results in the lake, but this is, this is a quite striking result that the Deer Lake Conservancy and people around the lake are quite proud of. Next, um, we are working on the management plan. Um, and no, this didn't happen because of zebra mussels. The zebra mussels, there are zebra mussels in the lake. There have been four zebra mussels that have been seen since or four incidences of zebra mussels that have been seen since they were found in 2016. Um, we're working on a management plan update right now and are right in the middle of it, um, kind of in the information gathering stage with a questionnaire to the board. We're, we're completing a property owner survey right now. That survey is being done online through SurveyMonkey and as of in, in the, it's actually finishing up today. I did not get a tally for today, but as of Monday, we had a 55% return rate um, on our online survey. We're reviewing our strategic plan from 2010 and have updated uh, progress reports. So all the information that's going to go into as, into as background information for the lake management plan. We'll be looking at 
updating land acquisition priorities. So the land acquisition, as Jim mentioned, takes a long time and the organization really needs to be ready, um, ready for a sale with a reserve fund for one thing, and also to really understand which properties are the most important for acquisition. And the, and the critical um, aspect is the ability to install conservation practices. So like any other plan, we'll be going through reviewing progress um, and, and goals that we had set out, how well we're achieving those, and then set forward um, actions into the future. Um, one of the key things that we're doing is developing, uh, I say it's key, I'm working on it right now, is developing an operation and maintenance manual. Um, waterfront property owners are responsible for maintaining the practices that are installed on individual properties and they sign agreements to maintain those um, for 10 years. So that's many, those 50 some properties are maintained um, by the homeowners themselves. The larger properties are maintained by the Deer Lake Conservancy and Jim has done most of that maintenance himself. So what we're doing now is creating a better institutional memory of all of the maintenance that's required. And hopefully some of that can be delegated and also passed on to new um, individuals as we go forward in the organization. So we'll have that history. Um, and then I mentioned the lake management plan will be developed, will be developed going forward. Um, our challenge um, it, this year is, of course, getting the input, um, as everyone else is facing with restrictions doing, due to COVID. Um, we have not had any in-person meetings, and we'll be, we'll be looking for um, effective ways to involve the board and lake residents beyond the questionnaire and the survey going forward. Next. And the partners in this organization, I have a list here and I know that I'm going to forget some people, but or organizations, um, Polk County Land and Water Resources um, has been, was really critical, especially in the beginning. The support from the DNR has also been really critical through planning grants, um, lake protection grants, the support that was provided to the um, Priority Watershed Program and you know helping us design our programs next and then there's a long list of other other um, organizations um, and people within those organizations that have have helped out um, i looked at this list and i noticed i'm of course missing several including university of wisconsin extension um, the landmark conservancy now holds an easement on one of the pieces of property, the Johnson Preserve, um, that was donated, or, or that was sold um, to the Deer Lake Conservancy. Um, so thanks to all of those. And I wanna close with that and open it up to questions for either Jim or I. Great, thanks Cheryl and Jim. We do have a few questions that came in. I'm probably just gonna go down the line and read through them. Um, so our first question was from Kevin, and he said, if you don't mind, uh, if you could talk about the total dollars spent to date on all the projects, if you, I don't know if you have an estimate on kind of the cost of all of the different projects over the years. Well, I can say it's over a million dollars. I do not have an exact number for you. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. And then the next question was from Madeline. Have you had any issues with the waterfront projects being removed when ownership changes? I know since that question came in, you did talk about the 10-year agreement. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but yes, that is absolutely a concern. And yes, ownership has changed. Um, in going over the agreements that we have, the cost share agreements for some of our medium scale projects, um, 
there have there has been some owner ownership changes and we'll set up meetings with the new owners and talk with them about the importance of the projects on their on their land um, so i can't think of instances where i know that new ownership has resulted in removal of practices and this parenthetically is the reason that the conservancy decided to go with land acquisition instead of easements because as soon as a property changes hands, it is going to be difficult if the new owner is not invested or at least supportive of the goal of the uh, Deer Lake Conservancy. By controlling the property, we are able to continue. We have some continuity of use. We know that these projects that the Conservancy has installed will be there as long as the Conservancy exists. Great, thanks you guys. And then we had, uh, Eric was, I think, kind of answering that question, but just to clarify from, from Jim and Cheryl that all of these different projects or which of these projects can be cost shared with the uh, Lake Plan Implementation Grants from DNR. That would include some of the bigger, I love that you call them neighborhood projects. I think that's a, a great name for them. And then the individual projects, those are, are both eligible, correct? They are both eligible, yeah. Right now there is no grant for any of the large, we don't have a large scale projects. We'll be seeking grant funding assistance for that watershed one diversion that Jim mentioned. Um, we'll be, we're just starting the design phase of that right now. But yes, there are, there's lake protection grant funding both for the waterfront projects, which I mentioned is all committed. And then we do have money available for the neighborhood projects. So a lot of times that's um, the neighborhood project is it's, it's runoff from off site. It might be from a field up above a back lot. It could, a lot of times it's a road. So it's water that's coming um, from along a road for a distance and then draining through a particular property. Great, thanks. And then Karen asked a question about long-term maintenance. What kind of long-term maintenance is expected of lakeshore homeowners who put in protection strategies? And I'm even wondering if you could go one step further and answer that maybe for the waterfront properties and the neighborhood projects. Sure, for the, the waterfront properties, it would be pretty standard. Um, if there uh, is rock infiltration, for example, it's a matter of keeping the surface of the rocks clean. So blowing off leaves and debris from the top, cleaning rain gutters and downspout collection bins um, of sediment and leaves so that clean water or cleaner water is going into the rock infiltration areas. For rain gardens, it's um, weeding and watering and making sure that any um, diversion berms or pipes are functioning appropriately. Um, the diversions or getting water to the infiltration practices can be one of the biggest challenges. And sometimes those diversions are created, um, they're earthen um, or they're gravel. So they need to, uh, homeowners need to pay attention to those and make sure that the water is getting to the rain garden or the infiltration area or being diverted over to the, to the woods where it can soak into the ground. The neighborhood projects get a little bit more um, involved, but again, it, it, it's usually a matter of making sure diversions are working appropriately. We have one large underground, um, it's really like a culvert um, with drainage holes in it in a bed of rock, which is going to have to be pumped out um, when sediment accumulates in it. Um, but those are the maintenance on the on the medium and smaller projects, and there's a bunch of maintenance also on the larger, on the larger facilities. Awesome, thank you. We had a question, we answered John's first questions, question regarding zebra mussels, and then he had a follow-up question on how many staff you have and how large is the operational budget, not counting any camp capital campaign acquisition. So there are no staff. Um, I work as a consultant to the Conservancy and um, I don't know, maybe 
20% of my time is allocated to work for the Conservancy. Um, Jim, I would say, is a full-time volunteer. He's out maintaining trails and maintaining um, projects all the time. And the operating budget, about 20000 That would be a good average. And some of these projects, which were thought to require a five or 10 year uh, maintenance, uh, especially uh, sedimentation basin or something like that. Uh, what we have found by using the prairie surrounds is that there is virtually no sediment running. So the Dry Creek watershed, which had produced a large sandbar out in the lake over the years from the outflow of sand from this area, <clears throat> when we put in the sedimentation dams, we thought they would have to be cleaned out. But because of buffering that native prairie does, and because of the effectiveness of the roots in holding soil at bay, after 25 years, we still, or 23 years, we still have yet to have to remove any sedimentation from these projects. So a lot of the estimates that we made on maintenance uh, have turned out to be much, much lower than what we thought. Great, thank you. And then we have one more question in the chat. So we do have more time. So if there are folks who have questions, feel free to keep typing those in. But we have a question from Eric. How has lake level changed over time? Is there any relationship to sucky depth that might be related to the lake level change? That's a good question. The lake level is um, quite stable on Deer Lake. There is a um, small dam. It, it just holds two feet of water back. Um, there and that holds the water level quite consistent. Um, I don't know, Jim can probably comment on that better than I because he's there all the time, but. That dam was installed in 1939 and the lake level has been very stable since. Um, in a drought year like 1987 or 1988, the lake level did drop a little bit, um, but there is not much fluctuation in lake level at Deer Lake. So I think that has little or no effect on Secchi Disc. What we have found that has affected the Secchi Disc is the removal of more than 60% of the watershed phosphorus, not to mention the effect of people behaving better with their direct drainage projects. The perimeter uh, homes around the lake are much more careful about what's running into the lake. The other interesting effect of the whole process has been uh, Deer Lake is a spring-fed lake, both internally and externally. You saw in both Rock Creek and in Watershed One, our two largest sources of external spring water coming into the lake. But as we infiltrate with basins, uh, more and more stormwater runoff, that has served as a recharge for the in-lake springs. Uh, so we're finding that springs, for example, that were quite strong in the lake, in the 1950s and virtually disappeared by the late 1970s are beginning to flow. Uh, that upwelling of water is consistent uh, and uh, these infiltration, large, especially large infiltration areas, have resulted in a significant improvement in the quality of spring water being delivered to the lake itself. I'd like to add a little bit as we look into this planning, you know, of course, what we're tracking in our phosphorus reductions for the watershed are phosphorus removal. And like other tracking exercises that I've seen, we aren't tracking any, you know, any additional inputs or concerns. Um, and I think one thing we've seen over the last couple of years in particular is additional uh, construction um, small homes being torn down or new homes being built on lots that had been undeveloped and significant runoff coming from um, construction sites. So I think that needs to be a focus, a focus going forward. The other thing that we see with new owners sometimes is removal of vegetation near the water and in particular cutting, clearing trees and both the Deer Lake Improvement Association and the Deer Lake Conservancy um, boards 
um, and members around the lake have been have been concerned about that and um, gotten the zoning office involved but those concerns are not always resolved um, easily so wanted to add those comments We do try to get an invitation to all of the new construction projects, either through a neighbor or a friend who uh, also lives on the lake, so that uh, we can get the conservancy involved early on in the construction process to make sure that the appropriate silt fence is put up, to make sure that the redirection of water from what will be now hard surface areas is put into an area where it can be contained and minimize the amount of sedimentation that could come into the lake. So we do take quite an aggressive uh, posture with that regard. And then finally, I didn't, I'd like to invite any, anyone to look at handout two, which is a tour guide for the Deer Lake Conservancy conservation projects and um, invite you to visit the lake. There's um, parking areas that are indicated either for a self-guided tour or to contact either Jim or I, um, and we can show you around and you could, could learn more about what's been done um, around your lake. We have had lake groups visit us from a number from Minnesota, but also South Dakota and Iowa, uh, even one from Michigan. So uh, what we have tried to do has spread way beyond our immediate area and we are happy to accommodate anyone interested in seeing what we have done and why we have done it. And we feel the results have been dramatic. I got a call a couple of years ago from some people that have been on the lake for something on the order of 30 years. And it was an excited phone call. Uh, and for the first time since they had been on their lake, on our lake, the um, swim raft that they have in approximately 25 feet of water, they could see the bottom so clearly that the gentleman who owned the property said, I could read the headlines in a newspaper if it was down at the bottom of the lake. We have found a July and August Secchi disc readings in years like 2015 to go up to 27 feet, which is really remarkable. Great. I'm just wondering, Cheryl or Jim, if the best way for folks to contact you, I mean, I've got your contact info, but could you even just type in the chat if there are folks who wanted to get in touch and maybe schedule something like a tour, then they would know the best way to get in touch with you. Okay. Great. Any other questions out there? This is Eric. I have a question I think that's kind of maybe calls on both of you, Cheryl and Jim, to reflect on. But um, do you get a sense, you mentioned properties being sold and kind of changes in the neighborhood. Do you get a sense that people kind of moving into the region or buying uh, second homes in the region, that they actually, uh, that they are drawn to your lake because of the accomplishments you've had, not just the water quality, but also sort of the landscape preservation and the, and the uh, recreational amenities? Are you creating something that's actually distinguishing this lake and its surroundings from other lakes in Western Wisconsin? Very much so, Eric. Um, I can't guess the number of people that uh, have told me that they purchased property on Deer Lake. Some of them have been called the Deer Lake Conservancy to find out if we could refer them to properties that might be uh, for sale. And it's because of the water quality. They've heard from friends or neighbors or read something about the Deer Lake Conservancy. Uh, we were covered in the Wisconsin Natural Resources magazine. And after that, we got a number of inquiries. But people very much who are concerned about water quality would like to be on Deer Lake because the water quality is improving. I think 
that graph that Cheryl showed about Secchi disc readings is particularly interesting because if you extrapolate the decline in water quality uh, had the Deer Lake Conservancy not existed, it's hard to say where we would be right now. The other thing that we found is that the uh, value of properties around Deer Lake has dramatically increased. Great, thank you. And then I saw we had a question come in from Tom. He was wondering if there's been any youth groups or schools out to view the properties or practices, sort of like a field trip. Not for a while. We had the Amory High School, um, they, they, they have a freshwater biology class and they actually helped us with some monitoring. Um, but school groups would be very welcome. And we've had several local schools, and it seems to depend more on the individual that's teaching the class. We had a seventh grade science class from St. Croix Falls come to tour. Uh, Unity High School, when they had a teacher who was very interested in uh, uh, ecology, uh, used to bring groups out annually. He's moved on to another school, so um, it depends a lot, I think, on the uh, the educational resources that the school offers. But we've had several uh, students from the Amory High School because we have an excellent science teacher there who've gone on to careers in, uh, in ecology uh, because of their work with the Deer Lake Conservancy as high school students. Thanks, Jim. And I did post the contact information for Cheryl. So she. And then also, I wanted to thank. sponsors are listed down below and so without all of our sponsors and our presenters and that are all yeah, and I'm not sure if uh, anyone else is having the troubles with Caitlin's mic uh, it might just be 